Now, yeah, yeah, Vicar, watch Gun Snob Yog, interview with Malcolm Brown of Isle of Wight Order of Druids. Gormila Mahagot Malcolm, August Kunasatu. Sorry, um, you're, uh, you, yeah, you're very so you uh, how, how are you, Mike? Malcolm? Right, I'm fine, thank you very much, how are you? Not too bad. Now, um, we'll be... Right, I'm fine, thank you very much, how are you? Cemented here. And I, I, here's the edit now coming in. <laughs> right, uh, okay. Malcolm, I'd like to ask you, when did you receive a call to Druidism and how long are you practicing it? If you ask a question of many Druids, you probably get the same answer that I will give, which is I always have been a Druid. You know, since I was a kid, um, the word Druid and Druidry is simply a label that's given to what many of us have always been. Uh, but, I mean, we've always had that connection with nature. Um, people like me as a kid, um, I grew up in a village. Uh, woods, meadows, river on one side, canal on the other, and where I spent most of my time was freedom, and I was everywhere. So, Druidry is a label. Druidry is a label. It's something that many of us already are, but we don't recognize it. Um, but of course, Druidry is more than that. Uh, it goes a lot deeper, but you know the basic level of connection with with nature. Um, it, many of us have it, but when oh, uh, must be in around two thousand, um, I health wise it was I knew it was time for me to retire, and I looked around. Two thousand and two, I moved to the Isle of Wight. My father was over here. He retired here in seventy eight. Mm. And it was time for for me to you know come across and keep an eye on him. Um, Sorry to that. Very soon after I arrived, um, and I was then left you know at a loose end, if you like. And I was looking around doing things. The islands were a real. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful and natural area. I mean, everywhere you look at forests and meadows and the fields and, and the beaches, um, it, I mean, it, it's beautiful. So I wandered around a bit. And by chance, I wandered up eventually uh, to a place called Stone, which is a, a Neolithic standing stone on the Isle. It was once the, the entrance to a long barrow. And that was interesting. I heard that the Morris side, or one of the Morris sides on the island, danced there. The dance had sprung up on the 1st of May every year. So I wandered up to join them in the very early hours in the morning and met a Druid there. And Morris, who was at that time, I suppose, you know, the, the main Druid on the island, uh, had just, uh, he'd been in the Druid network. He'd been a governor of the network. He was very active in Druidry. But when he came across the Isle, he decided to relight the candle for Druidry on the island. So um, the place he decided they were going to gather was on Longstone. And I met him there, and there was himself, his partner, and a lady and myself. And that was the sum total of the people uh, who were gathering for, for this uh, Beltane celebration after the Norris men had finished. And he, he said, come and join us, and I said, no, I'm not so sure about that. Um, uh, but we kept in touch for various reasons, and he decided to start a grove. Cut a long story very short. I went along, joined the grove. He became ill. I stepped in to help him. I ended up running the grove. And um, that was really you know, where I sort of came into the the recognition of what druidry was about beyond my you know, as a kid cycling around in nature and then it all got complicated as it often does in life and we formed two groves and i went off 
uh, because there were people who wanted something more attuned to nature than, than other people in the original Grove wanted. Uh, there are so many different influences, everything Native American uh, onwards, really. So I agreed to form this new Grove, keeping in touch with the um, Druid of the other Grove, who was increasingly ill and really um, was not going to be able to continue much longer, sadly. And that's really how I came into it, but it's a lot more involved than that. I mean, I've, I was involved with the Order of Mars, Ovates and Druids, took their first two courses. Um, I, through the Druid Network, I became involved with other Druids. Um, I was invited to be an advisor for the World Survey of Druidry alongside the heads of Obod and British Druid Order. Um, and I, I found myself quite busy. And I then began to wonder, hmm, well, you know, uh, okay, but what's at this stage? What do I do next? Yes, I do, yes. Uh, and yeah. you now know the other white order of Druids. I remember of, and studying has to be a Druid on Druid. No, exactly. um, right. You actually have answered half the <coughs> questions I have here with all that with that statement. <laughs> uh, the questions tend to happen like that. Yeah, they do. Yes, the questions tend to happen like that. Do in your in your opinion, but um, all right. Now you about going back to nature. Now a lot of viewers here now would be under would have different ideas of what a druid actually is, um, especially with modern druidism. Now modern druid. <laughs> Um, and, and modern druidism, like, like there, there's some people, some I don't blame druids, them. or some people who call themselves druids, um, would say that neo druidism is the, the old druidism. What would you say to that? Uh, to that claim, I would say we can be, but not necessarily. Uh, I would say we can be, but not necessarily. Uh, in, the people who call themselves Druids today, that there are really three types. There's what we call the Reconstructionists, who look back to the ancient Druids and seek to reconstruct um, that belief insofar as it's legal today to do so. Um, then there are the Revivalists, and the Revivalists look at the um, Druidry that began to be um, Mm -hmm. extracted from the old legends, the old stories, the writings and so forth in the 18th century, uh, what was called the time of the Druid revival. And then there are the, what I would call the Neo-Druids, the, the modern Druids, whose focus is very much on Druidry as a new belief, but inspired by the past. It doesn't copy the past, but it takes its inspiration from it. Um, they all call themselves Druids, and they all have quite different ideas of what Druidry is. But the wonderful thing about Druidry is they're all right. Uh, all of them are Druids. There's, I won't say there's no such thing as Druidry, but there's no such thing as a single definition of what Druidry is. Every Druid follows their own belief their own version of what Druidry is, within a very basic context of reconnection with nature and the uh, connection with the seasons um, and respecting um, the elders, the, the ancestors, um, the flavours of, of what the ancient Druids would recognise, but in a modern context. Uh, Druidry today, tomorrow, um, not necessarily yesterday. Um, but within the simple context of connecting with nature, we're all Druids. They're actually called those Druids. How we do that depends upon our perception of Druidry as we each practice it. And it can be quite different. I mean, you can find Christians who are Druids. There's a lot to them. You can find any um, recognised religion today, and probably some unrecognised ones, which um, 
the people that follow us are also druids. Um, so to try to explain to somebody, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I occasionally give lectures and sit in front of an audience who wonder who I am, and whatever, I'm, what, what is it that I'm talking about. Um, it's quite difficult. <laughs> Their idea of Druidry is what they see at Stonehenge at the summer solstice. Uh, they have very little idea of it beyond that. Uh, and, and that makes it difficult <laughs> because there is no simple definition of Druidry. We have no dogma. There are no rules. You can be what you like as a Druid as long as you connect with nature, respect it, honour it. You can treat it as a a philosophy of life, uh, living in harmony with nature, respecting it. You can treat it as a spiritual belief, recognizing that you know, everything in nature is spiritual. They all, everything has a spirit, not just human. You know, we're animals. Uh, we're descended from mammals. Why should we have a spirit and the local fox from the past not? Yeah, we're all the same. <laughs> and then there's the religions. Um, there are many Druids who treat it as a religion with their own deities. And it can be any deity you like. Um, I know Druids who follow the, the Egyptian deities. It can be the Greek deities. It doesn't have to be the old Celtic deities. Um, entirely up to the individual. Or you can be an agnostic or an atheist <laughs> and still be a Druid. Is, um, Which um, makes it a very interesting yeah, belief. To investigate, yes. uh, <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. It's very difficult to pin down. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's it, 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 very difficult to pin down. Uh, and that, I think, is, is why so many people are attracted to it. I'll, do it my way. Uh, I'll be a druid, you know, yeah. but I'll do it my way. But uh, if a person. And that's fine. Um, <coughs> no, I'm doing uh, your, um, the Silver Birch course at the moment. And there's um, other courses that be involved as well, which are all free. Yeah. Um, which I w w would like to mention. Um, mm. uh, so uh, this would be kind of way of just maybe not. It's kind of to give a a, a, a structure to the individual, and they can actually work around it with their own uh, system. Yes, yeah, so the well, yes, the problem with Druidry is that because it's so broad that if you decide how, or you ask yourself, how do I learn about Druidry? I want to be a Druid, but how do I learn Druidry? Google um, Druid teaching course. What a choice you've got. And each one of them says, we will teach you Druidry. And you say, fine, fine, right. But they're all different. They're all saying different things. There's an underlying you know, basic current. But how they teach Druidry and what they say Druidry is can vary dramatically. Um, some orders, or one order in particular, teaches Druidry as shamanism. Well, I would never do that. Um, uh, it is an entirely legitimate part of Druidry. But Druidry is not shamanism. There's a difference there. Um, some teaching orders are very, what I would call, inward-looking. They, they talk about um, you know, the mind. You know, it, it, a lot of it is... Um, what you you know what's going on in your mind that's where you know that's where the spirit is you know, the spirit is in you so what we need to do is to um uh, explain to you how to um live with that that spirit how 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 it functions within you what its role is um and that's, that's very true i mean that is part of Druidry. you don't know about that whatsoever but if you walk into one order and say, that's Druidry, you're wrong, because there's lots and lots. I mean, you walk into the average bookshop nowadays, and the shelves are groaning in the books about Druidry. 
And they all explain Druidry and aspects of Druidry in their own ways, in different ways, which makes it difficult. Um, somebody at the beginning, how do they learn the basics and then make an informed choice about how they go further into Druidry and learn more? Um, my original intention was simply that, helping people make an informed choice. Get the basics right. Um, explain the fundamentals, the very, very simple basics. And say, right, now you know that, now you can go off and explore further. That's what you should do. And then there's the other point that you'll find that many of the uh, yes, I do find that. teachings and that does put people are off businesses. Yes, I mean, the, the, but I can also understand that yes, I don't understand have, that, have to you, you, earn a living as well. You have to respect that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if you want to get people to write well, Exactly. Um, if you want to get people to write courses, you want to print them, you want to um, have an enrollment method, you want to send out the right parts of the course to the right people at the right time. You've got a very complicated organisation there. Um, and you've got to pay the people who run the office and pay the people who write the courses. So, you know, um, but of course, as soon as you do that, you've got to tax. You have accounting systems. You're going to have tax on your business. Uh, it, it all becomes business. And that's something that I think um, it's inevitable. But perhaps you know, when we start, we don't want to really think about that or worry about it. You know, let, let, let's just um, recognize that. A lot of people don't have a great deal of money in their pockets. They have to feed themselves and their families. They have to put a roof over their, their heads. Can they really afford to spend money on courses run by businesses yeah, to teach them about the truth? And they can't. But why should they, why should they be denied the right to explore Druidry? Simply because they can't afford it. It's not fair. So there was clearly a need for teaching the basics, the fundamentals, explaining what they were, clearly and simply, and letting people making then their informed choices about what they wanted to do. There was also the matter of keeping it free as far as humanly possible. Um, so all those jobs that I, I now outlined, I do. Um, I, this morning, I sent out, I think, over over well over a thousand emails yeah, with um, various parts of various courses uh, on to various people. I'm good, I'm glad he got there. Um, <coughs> we've gone it from November 21 when there were basically mm -hmm. five of us, um, myself, the Druid I mentioned. And three people on the island who, who started on the course to almost 2,000 members from New Zealand to Canada, Japan to Argentina. Um, absolutely. Well, I don't think we've got anybody in India at the moment, but um, that will come. That will come. Uh, certainly, we've got people in Africa. Um, uh, mm. It, it's taken me quite by surprise. Um, I have no idea that it's going to happen. Um, but no, we go with it. It, it, it shows that the need was there. And you know, we're fulfilling that need. Uh, now I've got to go do is keep it going. It's got, uh, um, <laughs> going as well. Uh, to head take the burden off you as well, isn't he? Well, yes, the, the idea of setting up regional centres was, here I am sitting on the Isle of Wight, I have a pretty good idea of the way that uh, people in the UK sit. 
I have a reasonable idea, I think, of how Druidry is practiced in the UK. But if I then talk to somebody in New Zealand or Canada, their perceptions are different. They're, they're, they're affected by where they live, their cultures, uh, their upbringing, and a whole range of things. And I don't believe that Druidry, there is only one Druidry. Um, everybody should practice the Druidry relevant to where they live. Relevant to their lives. Uh, I, I, I did come across a Druid who, who told me that you couldn't be a Druid unless you were a Celt. Uh, I, I, my first question is, what was a Celt? Which, I mean, not even the historians uh, can, can agree as to what the ancient Celts were. Many of them read to say that the ancient Celts didn't exist as, as we perceive them as a single culture. Um, but no, he was absolutely adamant you had to be a Celt before you can be a yeah, Druid. Well, that would be well, not. correct because uh, um, the Celts didn't arrive in Ireland until uh, um, the start of the Iron Age. And the, there were all the all the sites, the megaliths here in Ireland, they're okay. all from a lot of them from the Bronze Age, right back to the yeah. Neolithic site, and that's where funerary rites started. And obviously, there was a spiritual yeah. connection back then. And most of those monuments were out of use uh, between uh, about. And most of those monuments went out of, out of use mm -hmm. uh, between yeah. about two thousand and one thousand five hundred BC. And the ancient Druids didn't turn up until about 400 BC. So uh, it's, it, it's, we really do need to get our heads round this particular issue of what is Druidry and what, why do we use the ancient sites? Uh, because they certainly were never Druid temples. I mean, there's no, no truth in that whatsoever. Um, they're gathering places, meeting places, uh, they're um, religious places, and the, the people who did use them and built them, they actually had similar beliefs, we think, animism, to uh, to, to what the Druids believe today. So there's a relevance, but um, they weren't Druids temples, so, I mean, that, that's nonsense. Um, but people around the world, different views, different cultures, different Druidry, they should therefore have uh, contact, people they can consult, um, um, people who can arrange gatherings um, within their region. We've had our first uh, re uh, regional gathering in North America, very successful. Um, I, you know, I hope that other regions will do the same. We've got a regional center in Australasia. I, we, in effect, have one in Europe, because that's me here. But I hope that you know, someone will come along and take that over. Um, the, whichever country, Spain, France, Germany, anywhere. Um, and, you know, the, the scope... Of, we, we have a growing number of um, members in, uh, in the Far East, um, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, the uh, Philippines, around there, as well as in Japan, up in the north. Um, a lot of people in South America, there should, there should be a South America regional centre. Um, something that, that works with the local people, offering advice and help uh, in Druidry when people want it. Uh, it's entirely flexible, no rules on it. We, we, I have a good idea of what, what I hope the regional centres will do, but it's not really what they're going to do from day one. And, you know, you know, people can contact me. Today, I, I probably had about 12 emails, I think, you know, asking for this and that and so forth. So they all come to me. Um, that's fine. That's what we're here for. But the regional centres are there to help and support. Nothing more than that. If, if people in the regions can ignore them, and not bother them, uh, it's English. It's totally no, a bit uh, upset. Right, you have gone through quite a lot of them, even the ones where you thought my questions were a bit dodgy. You actually have answered them there. There is one. Um, well, the game, the game, the game the framework. The, uh, and you, we kind of covered it um, briefly. Um, like uh, about the, the sites, like you mentioned yourself there, you met the Druid at um, the Longstone, which is uh, well, part of a barrow. 
Um, I better explain, a barrow would have been a burial chamber normally found in the, the British Isles yeah. and are quite large. Um, they would be quite similar to the core tombs yeah. uh, built around the same time as core tombs in Ireland. So they would be r- roughly the same uh, Bronze Age um, people, the same uh, Neolithic peoples. Right. Yeah. Um, now, the right. one yeah. thing that has and it has been proven in certain, especially here in Ireland, is that, um, like for example, you have the larger stone circles, like the one in Drombeg, which I go to quite annually for Lunasa. Yeah. But the only thing is, I'm actually going at the wrong time, which I do know, because uh, yeah. Lunasa isn't um, indicated by the stone circle. <laughs> Whereas, um, if if we'll indicate the equinoxes, it will indicate the right. um, imbolg or you call it Imbolc, um, Bialtna, uh, and so on. It, it will, sorry, not Bialtna, sorry, it doesn't indicate Bialtna, <coughs> but it will show the, yeah, the two equinox, well, the equinox is at the same point, and as well as uh, Imbolc and so on, they'd be on the same point as well. But they're always at sunsets. And then you'd have the, um, the salsas, which would be always at the sunrise, which would be through the, the portal stones. Um, now, the Fulafia, I have you heard of those? No. They're well, they're they're Bronze Age, um, in, no. so they be kind of uh, troughs made of stone, and yeah, yeah. Um, they uh, there was one in Drombeg as well. There was one in yeah, 2019. Yeah. There is um, a few of them around various areas, like even uh, the D style that's in Knocknakilla, which you probably first saw. Uh, and the, for the, where I was for the summer solstice, right. um, which I kind of uploaded to the, the site for the, right. um, the Isle of Wight Dru- Druid order. Um, basically, it was a trough, it was filled with water, and they mm. burnt a huge fire and they put huge stones, large stones, into the fire. Then they rolled them into right. the water and uh, they'd wrap meat in straw. Right. And they put that into the water because the, the, the hot stones would actually boil it. Right. And uh, there was, there's been a lot of. Right. Um, how to put it? Uh, there's been a lot of uh, animal, um, bo- yeah, gnawed bones found as as for the uh, for the fossil collection there. Right. And the only like even in Drumbeg itself, there's right. t- three. Um, Bronze Age burials that are actually inside inside the circle itself, so um, they're going right. It's been a, a funerary site. It's been a, a site for diff- showing different points of the year for especially for the har in relation to the harvest cycle, and then you also had the celebration element, which would be in the full of fear. Um, so like there has been some sort. It has been they have been some place for gatherings, but there's other places that um, they're still not sure about. Um, like for example, um, some barrows have found right. to have certain um, alignments. Like some might align with the solstice, some might align with the equinox as well. So um, no, whether uh, that was by accident or on purpose is still not a certain. But um, it's uh, it kind of shows that there was uh, some sort of um, religious aspect or some kind of um, funerary aspect to do with the with the cycles in of of nature itself. If you yeah. get me, yeah, the, the long stone on the island. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the long stone on the island. Mm-hmm. Uh, currently, one standing stone and one recumbent stone. Upright. Yeah, um, we think the recumbent stone was once upright, and um, mm-hmm. the long barrows was eroded away, it disappeared. It, it was uh, um, excavated, I think, in the nineteen fifties. Um, and so they identified it was there or had been there. Um, but when you look at the um, the way the long barrow goes to the right, to the west from the long stone, um, and if you were to stand theoretically on the top of that, and the other recumbent stone was upright, yeah, you would be looking directly at the sunrise on the winter solstice. So uh, I mean, those and also Stonehenge and all the others. Uh, I mean, uh, I was looking uh, this morning um, at the Phoenicians 
you may well ask, why was I looking at the Phoenicians? Very good question. Um, all to do with Star Law. And there's a site on the island of Sicily, which um, was a Phoenician trading post. And there have been some discoveries there uh, of, of uh, mounds and temples and, and a, a big um, pool. And they say, the archaeologists and presses say, that the alignment of all the items there, all the, 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 the temples and so forth, are from the winter solstice. Uh, I've heard the same thing about African stone circles. And also the one in Malta as well. Um, the it, 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 it's a universal thing. Right. It's a universal thing. The I was talking to somebody in Australia and something came up uh, about the amazing uh, indigenous people in, in Australia. And winter solstice and summer solstice came up again. Um it, 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 it's a universal thing, it's not just and that brings um, us back you know, to not just Celtic or, 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 or you know, so called Celtic uh, set to or, one particular um, race as such. It's basically it's a worldwide um, aspect. Yes, uh, and uh, the yeah. yes, uh, and uh, the, the that seems to me to be so logical. I mean, there are two points in the year. Which are specific turning points. Two points uh, the summer solstice and the winter solstice. Are those two points either the evenings grow longer or the evenings grow shorter? One is a gateway into summer, one is a gateway into winter. Um, it's How could people not notice this? Um, it was you know, one of those things, I mean, very difficult to tell exactly when the equinox is. Um, and we, when you decide to celebrate um, before you start the harvest, well, the harvest in Scotland and the harvest in, in the south of England started at different times. But the, you know, the, the constant things are the two solstices. So it doesn't surprise me that you know, they're celebrated across the world. Um, right, now I think I've yeah. gone through all of the questions. Well, no, actually, no, they're basically in, 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 in that order. Um, <laughs> like, uh, you have, uh, well, I, I don't have to ask that because I've heard it twice, actually. And so, um, I would like to say uh, thanks, William Malcolm. Delighted, Jordan, but thank you for the invitation. No problems. And what. Um, Delighted, Jordan, so but thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you're not uh, an Irish speaker. So I'll I'll say it in English first, so that well a lot of people aren't English, right. aren't Irish speakers either. But I'll go with Irish. Great Maha Good Ogs Great Maha Ogs Olish. Fair Ogs Mano. Show a all of Malcolm Brown. So basically, um, again, thank you very much for your time and wisdom, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I give you um, the Druid Malcolm uh, Brown. Thank you very much for the opportunity. No problem. <laughs> Thanks a million for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity.